Oh. Okay. Uh, welcome to uh, session number 11 of Introduction to Worldviews and Apologetics. I'm Dr. John McMath, uh, retired from the Moody Bible Institute. Uh, and I'm joined here today by my friends in Italy and the Philippines. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's uh, good to have you with us. Today, we'll be looking at uh, the, the second major approach to the defense of authentic Christianity, which is apologetics. Uh, today, we'll be looking at the approach we call evidentialism. Uh, last week, we took a look at uh, the classical apologetic. Classical apologetics is called that because it's historically the original apologetics. It emphasized human reason, uh, the ability of man to argue to reasonable conclusions based on uh, philosophical arguments. Uh, and classical apologetics is still done. It's, it's definitely a thing. Uh, and um, uh, all of us who uh, study apologetics uh, spend time uh, working through uh, the various approaches of classical apologetics. Evidentialism is a different uh, thing, not entirely, but it's a different thing. And uh, let me share the uh, share the screen. Let's see if I can do this. Ah, yes, here we go. Bang. Okay, and it's up. Wow. This guy on the right uh, was uh, uh, famous when I was a little boy. Uh, he, one of the uh, when television was first invented and used in this country, one of the earliest uh, TV shows uh, had been a radio show real early, but then it became a, one of the earliest TV shows. It was a cops and robbers show uh, set in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, this particular uh, police detective is Sergeant Joe Friday. Uh, and one of his famous lines, uh, he used this line probably half of the shows is just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Uh, when he'd be talking to a witness about what happened or who said what or what she saw or whatever, just the facts, ma'am. Uh, apologists who put an emphasis on the facts of history, science, textual criticism, and that sort of evidence are called evidentialists. That's really straightforward. Uh, this is a modern American uh, evangelical approach to apologetics. It's, uh, 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 we see quite a bit of it going on in Europe, uh, but it hasn't really uh, hit a lot of the rest of the world is really a, an American evangelical thing. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, American popular apologetics is almost always evidentialism. Uh, this insists that Christianity is factual. That is, the, uh, the, the stories of the New Testament are not merely theologically true, they're actually historically uh, scientifically, um, technically, and in every other way, uh, factual. They're real, they're real stories. They're, they're really true. Uh, and that this can be demonstrated by a presentation of the evidence. So all we're interested in is the facts. We'll start with the facts of the various areas. Whatever can be established, uh, as evidence in a courtroom can be accepted as uh, evidence. And uh, that's, that's what we're after. Uh, it's it kind of an interesting, uh, interesting approach. It uh, um, is uh, uh, an, it not as remote from 
the classical apologetics as we would think. Uh, the uh, evidentialist uses some of the same arguments for the existence of God, for instance, simply uses a, uh, a different emphasis. Uh, so when we talk about, oh, for example, the teleological argument, uh, teleological argument says um, uh, there's a great deal of evidence for design in the world. And the classical argument, we just state that. Uh, if you look at the world, it's obviously been designed. A design doesn't exist without a designer, therefore a designer exists. The designer must be big enough, smart enough, eternal, infinite, so on. That designer is properly called God. Okay, that's a classical argument. The evidentialist uh, will say something to the effect of, uh, everything that has a design has a designer. The world is obviously very well designed. Consider the porpoise and go on and, and give a technical description of the sonar system that lives in the porpoise nose, okay? Which is a, an absolutely magnificent piece of engineering. It's much, much better than a multi-billion dollar uh, submarine. It's just really, really good. It's really, really cool. Uh, and the emphasis in this kind of apologetics approach uh, is on the interesting facts, facts of science, facts of history, uh, facts of uh, textual criticism. This is, this is a really interesting area. Uh, I enjoy uh, dealing with the manuscript evidence for the New Testament uh, because it's just kind of neat. Uh, because I'm an Old Testament guy, I also uh, get into the manuscript evidence for the Old Testament. Uh, just recently, uh, one of the oldest uh, pieces of biblical inscription ever found uh, dates back to about the ninth century BC was found in Jerusalem. Uh, these things keep popping up. That's really, really neat. And the people who say that the Bible wasn't written until uh, shortly after the time of Christ or something like that, uh, always have to butt up against these hard facts. So the evidentialist says that by accumulating a pile of historical and scientific and textual and other kinds of facts, physics, whatever, uh, we can demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt that God exists, that the resurrection happened, uh, uh, that Christianity is essentially true. Okay, that's the, that's the approach. Uh, where'd this come from? Uh, the, uh, the Enlightenment opened up a whole world of uh, scientific investigation. Uh, prior to the 17th century, uh, uh, science was a rare thing. People like Galileo and others uh, did some fascinating uh, studies, uh, but it really wasn't until the 17th century uh, that uh, philosophers began turning away from a medieval view of the world, uh, of entirely top-down, God making everything happen, uh, miracles in constant uh, appearance. And in, in some ways, that medieval viewpoint was um, oversimplified. Now, God definitely is in charge of the world, and there's a there's a, a great deal of truth in the medieval theological approach to the world. Uh, but the Enlightenment philosophers began putting an emphasis on scientific investigation, and very quickly, uh, the Industrial Revolution began happening. Uh, scientists began studying things without starting with the Bible. 
Uh, they just went directly to nature and discovered how things work. Now, those of us who are believers recognize that, uh, that the world is a very orderly place and it obviously was designed. Uh, but it is possible to approach the world without ever opening a Bible, without ever thinking about God. And the Enlightenment philosophers demonstrated that that could be done. I think they're, they're wrong to do that, but they demonstrated that that could be done. And by the uh, 18th century, people were beginning to believe that science would provide the answers to every question on purely naturalistic assumptions. Uh, and that soon, God would be unnecessary. Uh, people used to speak of the God of the gaps, uh, that we only need faith to explain the things we can't understand scientifically. Uh, but that's uh, that's no longer something uh, that is spoken of. Many secular science types uh, believe that everything can be explained. God is completely unnecessary. We don't even need to talk about him anymore. Uh, in the 19th century, a little over 150 years ago, uh, Charles Darwin uh, invented the theory of evolution. Uh, evolution is an idea that has been around for a long, long time, but Darwin's origin of the species um, couched in scientific language and with lots and lots of evidence from the natural world, most of which doesn't support <laughs> the, the idea of evolution. But Put that aside, 150 years ago, people really didn't know that and didn't know how to, uh, how to challenge that. Uh, but Darwin provided, most importantly, a reasonable explanation of the universe without God. And so evolution was applied to virtually everything. Uh, people began saying, well, if, you know, uh, animals uh, evolved, probably the Bible evolved as well. It, it really wasn't written by uh, Moses and the apostles and whoever, but by six other guys who were writing under assumed names. Uh, yet, uh, they invented all kinds of strange stories. And uh, none of those um, have panned out, uh, but they, they were popular. And they still are amongst people who simply haven't studied very much. Uh, one of the religious approaches to a naturalistic worldview is one that we, we looked at earlier. Uh, it uh, was a complete worldview that we call deism, the belief that there is a God who created, but then walked away from his world to leave the natural laws to explain everything. Uh, so the, the laws are there. Uh, this God who is powerful enough, uh, big enough, uh, smart enough, good enough to create the world out of nothing, uh, decided that that would be his only miracle. And he just walked away from it all and got bored or something and walked away from the universe. Uh, it was Christians and the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries uh, who began to use scientific methods and arguments to oppose deism. Uh, and as the scientific revolution exploded, so did the anti-deism movement. They also attacked evolutionism, also atheism, using scientific methods uh, to demonstrate the irrationality of the non-Christian point of view. Uh, and there are some uh, there are some weak spots in the evolution or in the uh, 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 evidentialist viewpoint, uh, but there are some very, very strong spots as well. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is Paley's watch. Uh, William Paley, uh, did uh, natural theology back in the 
uh, 18th century, uh, died in 1805. Uh, and uh, he asks you to consider uh, a, uh, a watch found in the forest. And you open the watch up and you can see that it's obviously an intricate mechanism. Uh, it obviously had a designer of some kind, an apparent design, order, a contrivance, a relationship of instruments to a purpose, subservience of means to an end and sensitivity of components. These are all features uh, which are also had by the universe. Since you'd conclude that the watch has a designer, you should conclude that the universe does too. It's a, it's a simple argument. This is um, uh, what we call the uh, uh, teleological argument. And instead of just asserting that the universe has a design, he asks you to look at a piece of evidence. Here it is, here's a watch. You'd agree that the watch has a designer, a watchmaker, uh, why is it so difficult to believe that the universe also has a designer? To say that the watch needs a designer, but something as complex as the universe doesn't is on its face um, absurd. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a good argument as far as it goes. Uh, uh, Paley provided lots of examples of good design in the natural world. And in his, uh, in his uh, uh, various books, he was using up to date for the day, scientific findings uh, to is demonstrate that the world is an orderly, well-engineered place with lots of carefully made interlocking parts like a giant watch. The universe shows multiple layers of design. Uh, as I've always uh, uh, liked to tell people, uh, when you've got a, uh, a non-trivial, complex uh, structure of some kind that works together properly, if it works, it's because of a, a designer, an engineer uh, figured out how to make it work, how to make the parts work together. When there are more than a couple of moving parts, uh, in order for them to work together, they have to be properly designed. Uh, this morning, I, I put some plumbing together. Uh, there, I, there was a, uh, uh, a socket that needed to be filled with a, with a plug. And so I've got one moving part and one part that's not moving. In order to make that plug fit the socket, there had to have been a standardization. Some designer had to come up with the, uh, the pitch, the uh, uh, depth, the thread diameter, uh, and a standardization uh, for precisely how down to the uh, 10th of a millimeter, uh, everything would fit together. Otherwise it wouldn't have fit. When things are random, they simply don't fit. You can pile rocks randomly, uh, but it's impossible to build any complex system. Uh, and we, we all know that. Um, and when you go out into the natural world, there are literally thousands of examples of design. Uh, the teleological argument is the argument from design. Uh, John Locke, who is most famous for his uh, 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 political arguments. John Locke is uh, the uh, uh, English philosopher and empiricist uh, who uh, laid a lot of the foundation for uh, the American uh, uh, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, uh, the idea that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's John Locke. Uh, and uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson used those words um, 
in order to lay a foundation for the American experiment in a political free state, instead of being ruled by uh, absolute monarchs or dictators, uh, the United States is supposed to be under the rule of law. And as long as that has been true, uh, the United States has been a, a, a fairly strong country. Uh, as happens most of the time, that's, we're losing that. But anyway, uh, John Locke argued that all philosophy should be grounded in the, uh, in the uh, deriving of truth from detailed evidence. Uh, we call this the empirical method. Uh, empirical means, uh, again, just the facts, just the details. Uh, this is the, uh, the method of Aristotle. Uh, the two great Greek philosophers that we always go back to are Plato and Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle uh, invented the uh, uh, the uh, deductive method or uh, rational method of thinking. Uh, uh, all, uh, uh, all birds have feathers, a duck is a bird, therefore ducks have feathers. Okay, that would be a, a deductive argument. Uh, it's a trivial argument, but that's kind of the way those work. An empirical method is a bottom-up method. Look at experimental findings. You go out in the world and you try to decide whether uh, uh, birds have feathers. And so you look at a bird, lo and behold, it's got feathers. You look at another bird, lo and behold, it's got feathers. Uh, and uh, you, you look at a hundred birds or a thousand birds, they've all got feathers. So you come to the conclusion that birds have feathers. Okay, now the, the problem with the empirical method uh, is that the best you can do uh, is a high probability. We'll talk about probability later. Uh, a probability is just that's exactly what, it's, what it sounds like. If a thing is probable, it's more likely than not. But there's always the possibility that the explanation you have simply doesn't account for all the evidence. There may be some smidgen of evidence that you haven't found yet. Uh, and so we keep, uh, we keep looking. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that uh, uh, evidential apologists love to have thick catalogs of evidence, evidence that you can look at. And, and I've discovered that uh, non-Christians have a, have a very uh, high tolerance for evidence. Uh, they can look at evidence all, all day and never see it. Uh, the evidential approach is particularly helpful uh, for teaching Christians, uh, especially uh, Christian young people who've been learning about the scientific method in school uh, really love to look at the details of a scientific argument. That's really fun for them. They're smart enough to understand it. They can visualize what you're talking about and away you go. Uh, it doesn't work so well uh, with non-Christians. But we should remember that Apologetics is really not designed to argue non-Christians into heaven. God does that by the power of his spirit. Uh, and we, with our apologetics methods, are helping that process along. Uh, when people begin asking questions, when their worldview is beginning to fall apart for any of a number of reasons, when that catastrophic failure is underway, we have the answers. Uh, but until God's spirit begins working with an individual, our answers don't mean anything to them. All right, let's see. Uh, so, yeah, a lot, of, uh, a lot of apologists after Locke used his methods. This is a, an English court. Uh, a lot of philosophers began using the 
uh, the model of the courtroom and the presentation of legal evidence. Uh, is a, a courtrooms are getting a lot more formal. Uh, there was a lot more uh, specific, uh, specificity to what could be admitted for evidence and what couldn't. Uh, chain of custody, and, uh, eyewitness accounts, and all, all kind of all kinds of things that are uh, insisted on. Uh, a fellow by the name of Thomas Sherlock. Uh, wrote around 1729 in England, uh, a, a book called The Trial of the Witnesses of the Resurrection of Jesus. And he spelled it just like it is there, T-R-Y-A-L. Uh, Sherlock argued for the historicity of the resurrection on the model of a court trial, examining evidence and witnesses as one would at a trial. Uh, it's, it's actually really good. Uh, it's, it's kind of old and there's a lot of stuff that Sherlock wasn't aware of. But when he's looking through the New Testament, uh, he treats the, uh, the elements of the uh, crucifixion resurrection stories uh, as uh, evidence in a courtroom. Uh, can these witnesses be trusted? Uh, were these witnesses uh, uh, eyewitnesses? Did they actually see the events that happened? Did they uh, handle the uh, objects that they claim they did? Uh, uh, what of the documents that we have? Are these, uh, can we establish a chain of custody? Is it clear? that the people claiming to have written these books uh, actually did write the books. Uh, were they in a historical location? Is there uh, uh, corroborating evidence uh, that would support the view uh, that the New Testament is a uh, reliable bit of evidence? Uh, by the uh, 19th century, uh, a very, very famous character, a professor of apologetics and theology in Scotland, in Glasgow. Uh, my father was, uh, uh, was born in uh, Glasgow uh, shortly before uh, James Orr died there. So I've got a kind of a connection there. I've never been to Glasgow, I've always wanted to, but it's, it's hard, to, hard to get there. Uh, but he was uh, he was one of the more famous uh, theologians uh, and apologists of the early 20th century. His books really defined evangelical apologetics during the early decades of the 20th century. Uh, and I've got two or three of his books over here on my shelf. He insisted that Christianity was not a mere collection of doctrines which are accepted by faith, but a complex life altered by the spirit and involving every aspect of the worldview and its practical interaction. Uh, and because of this, or argued, Christianity is best proved by historical evidence. And by that, he means the, the actual evidence on the ground. Uh, uh, Archaeology was just beginning uh, toward the end of his life. And he was beginning to understand how important it was to establish external corroboration support uh, for the biblical story. Uh, and he demonstrated how that could be used uh, by, by showing that uh, the events that the Bible described really happened in space-time history. Uh, these are these are not myths. Uh, these are uh, uh, eyewitness accounts of actual people who were there. Uh, so the uh, the doctrines of the church don't have to be accepted by faith, by which he would mean mere credence. You don't have to believe things that are unbelievable. Uh, we, we believe things because they are 
true. And this is demonstrated uh, by the study of history, the study of archaeology, the study of science, the study of all of the evidence. So, or argued, and, and this is kind of the, uh, the essence of the evidentialist approach uh, to uh, apologetics. Uh, he argued that the brute facts of history are not self-interpreting. Uh, by brute facts, he means the, just the facts alone. Okay, here is a, here is a tomb that happens to be empty. Uh, that doesn't prove anything. Uh, it's, um, uh, it proves something when it's put in the narrative that explains it uh, in the life of the church, in the production of the New Testament. Believers of the early centuries gave life to their faith in the actual facts of the historical gospel. So the brute facts happened. Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus was resurrected. The church was planted and expanded. Okay, and in the process of that, the New Testament uh, is the documentary uh, record of what eyewitnesses actually did and said and saw. Uh, the living church, the church that you and I are a part of today, is the result of all of this. And the, uh, the, the living church today is not something that appeared in a vacuum. Uh, the church exists because for 2,000 years, uh, believers have passed their faith uh, from one generation to the next deliberately um, producing a new generation of believers who look back to the evidence recorded in the New Testament, which explains the brute facts on the ground. Uh, there were eyewitnesses who actually saw what really happened uh, and uh, uh, saw the artifacts of that uh, with their own eyes, felt it with their own hands. Uh, so Jesus really did rise from the dead. Uh, this group of students of mine is uh, at a place we call the Garden Tomb in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and this, I, my goodness, if we took these pictures a long time ago, I think this is almost 30 years ago now. Uh, and the uh, uh, the elderly gentleman who was uh, was the guide is uh, uh, gone to glory now. He's he's with the Lord, uh, and and the uh, uh, the tall uh, young man there was uh, uh, a high school teacher at the time. This was a senior class back then. All of those kids in the background have grown up, and they've got children of their own. And uh, uh, Kirk, the a uh, tall kind of blondish character uh, is uh, ready for retirement. Uh, he's, he's getting, he's not quite my age, but he's getting there. But Jesus really did rise from the dead. Uh, it was very difficult for the Jews of that day to argue against the fact. The tomb was really empty. The uh, Roman soldiers uh, really let Jesus get out of the tomb. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the apostles really weren't uh, big, scary uh, monsters who could do an insurrection and drive the Romans away from the tomb. They couldn't do that. They didn't want to do that. Uh, prior to the resurrection, the apostles had no particular reason to believe that it could ever happen. So the, the church really did turn the world upside down. They overwhelmed the pagan world. Uh, ancient Roman and Greek paganism, the polytheism of the ancient world, and even the mystery religions 
of that same Greco-Roman world uh, were washed aside. Europe became a Christian continent. Um, from there, the church began to spread to all the world. It's much slower than we'd all like, but that's, that's history. So this really happened. The documents of the New Testament really were produced by baptized Jews of the first century who were eyewitnesses to the facts. Uh, when we take something into court, uh, the, uh, the, the best kind of witnesses are eyewitnesses and the best kind of uh, documents are primary sources, a document actually written by somebody who was there, uh, a, uh, a letter signed by somebody and dated, uh, an affidavit uh, sworn under an oath by somebody who knew something that is material. That's the best kind of evidence. Uh, and we all pretty much uh, know that. Okay. Uh, 20th century, uh, starting shortly after uh, uh, World War II, and I believe he's still alive, although I haven't, I haven't checked. John Warwick Montgomery is an American theologian uh, and a lawyer and historian. And it's his uh, lawyer vocation that is interesting here because uh, his approach to evidentialism uh, is uh, literally uh, uh, dominating uh, uh, the American apologetic uh, uh, movement. Uh, he's, uh, he's the name that is always mentioned. He's got to be uh, well and thoroughly retired by this time. Uh, but uh, back in the days, we used to talk about Warwickianism. Uh, he's uh, uh, that strongly uh, evident. He's dominant in the in the field. His apologetics was strongly influenced by his background in law. He argues from the nature of evidence and from the rules of evidence in the courtroom. Uh, uh, John Warwick Montgomery was a professor of a more recent evidentialist, Josh McDowell who wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, uh, which was shortly thereafter followed by, uh, by more, uh, strangely enough called More Evidence That Demands a Verdict and Still More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Uh, Josh McDowell uh, uh, has done a huge task of collating, uh, collecting, and, um, uh, explaining primary source uh, documentation uh, for the resurrection. Uh, he's a, a brilliant guy. Uh, his son, uh, Josh McDowell II, uh, is now coming up through the ranks. Uh, he finished a really good PhD uh, project at uh, where I can't remember where he did this. Uh, but has started publishing himself. I saw him at a conference a few years back, probably 10 years ago, uh, and he was talking about uh, textual criticism. Uh, this is, this is a, a kind of a cottage industry, uh, this theologian, lawyer, historian combination. Uh, and it works very, very well. But to go back to Montgomery, uh, he speaks of the authenticity of the uh, New Testament as uh, evidence. Uh, so we can ask the question, well, what is it that uh, can, uh, can disqualify a piece of evidence? So here in the background, you see some, uh, some uh, manuscript chunks, actually, they're uh, pottery fragment chunks with with writing on them. Okay, well let's let's think about this. There can be a variety of different sorts of defects. Uh, for example, uh, maybe uh, uh, internal defects. 
So if you see a, a piece of evidence produced in court, but the witness himself is not trustworthy, uh, let's say he, he produces a note that he claims uh, he wrote at the time that the crime was committed. But we know that this particular uh, fella is a, is a drug dealer, uh, a felon, uh, that he's uh, uh, been arrested many times, uh, and there are currently warrants out for his arrest again. Should we trust him? Well, no. <laughs> he, he probably has, a, uh, he has reason to lie. Uh, so we ask ourselves, uh, are there any reasons that, that this witness uh, or this piece of evidence would not be uh, trustworthy? When we apply that to the New Testament, we discover that the New Testament was written by men, and it's all men in the New Testament, whose character was unimpeachable. The, uh, the writers of the New Testament, for the most part, were uh, baptized Jews of the first century uh, who believed that Jesus had been raised from the dead uh, and who presented in the Gospels the primary source, firsthand eyewitness accounts of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. They then went on to, uh, to live very public lives, uh, exemplary in character, and uh, all of them, except uh, uh, the Apostle John, died martyrs' deaths uh, and continued to claim uh, that they had seen the risen Christ. Uh, to the day of their martyrdom, even under the threat of death, uh, they died for their beliefs. These are trustworthy witnesses. Uh, the uh, uh, people who say otherwise uh, are fighting uphill. There's not, there's no evidence that these men were scoundrels or liars or didn't exist. Uh, we know too much history for that. Uh, external defects can uh, mess up evidence. Uh, maybe there's some motives or reasons that the witness may be lying. Uh, so this drug dealer on the stand uh, may have been promised a, a better deal when his uh, uh, case comes up. Uh, that would be a good motive. And he could have, could have lied. But the New Testament authors had no motive to lie and often continued proclaiming the gospel all the way to a martyr's death. Uh, internal inconsistency. The testimony itself contradicts itself. Uh, so if you've got, if you're, you have a witness on the stand and she can't remember whether it was a Tuesday or a Thursday, whether she got to the house where the party happened uh, in a car or on the bus, uh, whether it was in this part of town or some other place, uh, who else was at the, at the party. We, by the end of it, you start saying to yourself, uh, this lady is lying. Uh, her testimony isn't consistent. She's not quite sure which story to tell, but the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible is telling the same consistent, trustworthy story. And sometimes there are external defects, uh, evidence that's outside the testimony of the witness himself uh, can be shown to contradict the witness. Uh, uh, for instance, the, uh, uh, the witness may say that uh, he, was, uh, he was nowhere near that particular tavern when the assault took place. Uh, but three other people who were at that same tavern and saw the events place him there. Well, who do you believe? <laughs> Somebody's lying. Uh, so you believe the more neutral witnesses. But when we look at uh, history and archaeology, these abundantly confirm the New Testament witness to the historical events that have been 
testified to. Uh, you you hear the uh, uh, you hear the witness present. He's a person of good character. He can't be impeached. Uh, there are no good reasons for lying, and there don't appear to be any lies. The testimony is consistent, uh, and all of the external testimony that can be examined supports the testimony of the New Testament. This is probably a true statement. Now, notice what I said. This is probably a true statement. Uh, and that's what we can do with evidentialism. It's good stuff. Uh, Montgomery spends a good deal of time uh, building the case for the resurrection. Uh, this is obviously the key to Christianity, and frankly, it's well worth a separate session. We're going to come back for the evidence of uh, the resurrection on another day. Uh, but arguing through that is one of the really worthwhile things that we can do uh, with uh, evidentialism. Okay, some characteristics of evidentialism. Well, let me see if I can make this go. Uh, first of all, it's uh, what we call eclectic. Uh, classical apologetics seem, uh, tends to be entirely philosophical. Uh, with uh, evidentialism, uh, the evidence comes from everywhere. All sorts of unexpected sources, from hummingbirds to medieval sculpture. This is uh, the the Bayeux Tapestry over in uh, in France. Uh, and this makes Christian evidences fun to teach, fun to preach. It's often useful in evangelism. It allows for really wonderful illustrations. Uh, uh, it's uh, the kind of thing that we can really, really use well with young people uh, because they'll they'll perk right up if they realize, oh, this isn't going to be theology. We're going to talk about hummingbirds. Now you've got them, uh, and, and away you go. And in the process, they discover uh, that hummingbirds are remarkable little mechanisms, uh, horrifically complex. Uh, they do something that. Uh, it has taken uh, modern science and physics to even come close to. Today, we've got you know, these cute little electric drones. Uh, but up until the last few years, it's been impossible for us to do anything remotely like a hummingbird. And God makes hummingbirds without even trying. You know, how does that happen? Oh, random chance. Give me a break. You know, seriously. Okay. Um, the use of evidence. Um, evidentialists are not really uh, demanding evidence before they believe. Rather, they believe because they've had an encounter with God. But when an evidentialist shares with others about the rationality of their belief, they share reasonable evidence. Okay, so here's the evidence. This is a, that's an evidence bag in a courtroom. Uh, and uh, there's a chain of custody and this is where it came from and uh, what case it belongs to, what, what are a list of everything that's in it. And from the evidence, you can derive a rational conclusion. If you have a bunch of evidence, which is really nice, uh, in a courtroom, the uh, the lawyer with the preponderance of evidence is likely going to win. Uh, I was in a uh, uh, I was in a trial years ago. The only one I've ever uh, sat through took most of a week, uh, and uh, it was a terrible thing about a about an older man who molested a little girl. Uh, it was really really awful, uh, but we didn't want to mess up somebody's life on the basis of no real evidence. Uh, so the prosecuting attorney uh, gave us piles and piles of evidence, photographs, uh, eyewitness testimony, uh, lots and lots of um, uh, maps and charts and stuff, probably a thousand pieces of evidence. Uh, when they defense attorney got up, uh, he, uh, he called uh, this, this guy's wife, 
who testified for him, the guy's mother, <laughs> an elderly lady, uh, and uh, a fellow who claimed to be the guy's pastor, uh, who I'd never known before in the uh, Christian community. Uh, and uh, all of them said, oh, he would never do a thing like this. But all of the evidence suggested that he did, in fact, do it. And we found him guilty because the evidence led to a rational conclusion. It was, in fact, a conclusion that we, the jury, uh, reached beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, a reasonable doubt uh, is uh, what you have when there's just not quite enough evidence to support this conclusion. Uh, and that, that's how evidentialism is used. Okay, the priority of facts. Um, evidentialists tend to begin with the facts, history, biology, mathematics, whatever they're using, and argue from there to biblical conclusions. Uh, they argue that the central claims of Christianity, like the resurrection, the founding of the church, all the rest, rest unavoidably on an inductive argument, an argument that's based on evidence. So here's a bunch of facts. Uh, and let's say we've got a thousand of them, but here's the first four facts. And you put all of that together and you can combine this into a big truth. And that big truth ultimately supports the truth of the Bible as a whole. So what are we trying to teach? Uh, we're, we're not teaching about uh, hummingbirds and uh, uh, granite in the Grand Canyon. Uh, we're, we're teaching that the Bible is true, uh, but the, uh, we, we build together composite truths that are big truths. Jesus really is the son of God. Uh, uh, Jesus really was uh, resurrected from the dead. Creation happened out of nothing. Uh, the, uh, the Jewish people are descended from Abraham who was called by God. All of these individual propositions from the Bible can be demonstrated by evidential arguments. And then we put the whole thing together. The Bible itself is a historically authenticated, uh, authoritative, primary source evidence. For what? For, for God, for salvation, uh, for the Christian worldview. Uh, and the beginning point is facts. The difference between classical apologetics and evidential apologetics is the starting point. The classical apologists will start with philosophy. Here are the, the uh, these are the, every, uh, 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 everything that exists but might not had a beginning. True enough. <laughs> the universe had a beginning. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Ah, okay, you know, that's, that's logical. The evidentialist begins with piles and piles of facts, evidence. He starts with evidence, the classical apologist starts with philosophy. Okay, oh, da, 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 da. Uh, probability, uh, we've mentioned probability before. Here's a, Here's a weather outlook for uh, the month of October for uh, the, the US. And it, it says it's gonna be cooler than usual down in uh, Florida. They just had a hurricane. And it's gonna be warmer uh, in the, the middle of uh, uh, the uh, uh, states and a little warmer than average in Idaho where we live. Okay. Uh, now, what are they? What are they doing? Uh, evidentialists produce arguments that give a high probability. So we've got a ninety percent chance of rain. Okay, well that's pretty high uh, probability. It's pretty likely that it will rain. Is it possible that where we are, there will be no rain on uh, uh, on that day? Yeah, that's possible. 
uh, we don't have absolute certainty. Just like a courtroom, the prosecutor has to demonstrate with his evidence that his charge is true beyond a reasonable doubt or by a preponderance of evidence. And that's what works. Most matters of great importance that are decided, decided in a courtroom are decided on the preponderance of the evidence. And that's good enough. Uh, content neutral method. Uh, there, <laughs> this is a scanning electron uh, microscope image. I think that's an ant. It's kind of an ugly looking uh, critter, but there, there it is. Uh, evidentialists use methods that are content neutral, uh, like a scanning electron microscope or, or the archaeologist's pick. Uh, these things don't care where, whether the argument is based on that evidence or, or not. They don't care if Christians use the microscope or the pick. Uh, the methods are neutral. Uh, evidentialists use history and archaeology, science in all its flavors, and anthropology and more, uh, and uh, use that to form this larger inductive argument uh, to go from there. Uh, a, um, uh, an important side note that is, uh, has gotten really interesting. And, it, and it's, it's a popular philosophic movement of the 20th century that, that claims that there is no such thing as objective truth. Uh, so everything is relative uh, is, the, is the proposition. But that assumes, accept this statement. Uh, some things are, are more relative than other things. Uh, and this statement is absolutely true. Uh, the statement, absolutely nothing is absolutely true, <laughs> has to be absolutely true if it's going to be true. But anyway, postmodernism uh, is uh, supposedly uh, uh, the rejection of modernism. Modernism is the uh, the name giving to the, the way of scientifically thinking things through from evidence to conclusions in a cause and effect relationship uh, that we call the scientific method. Uh, and uh, the postmodernists have, have claimed that science has failed us. It does bad things like pollution and nuclear weapons and whatnot. And therefore, we can't listen to science anymore. We've got to quit that altogether. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, conclusion they make is that all truths are subjective or relative and purely personal. Uh, Postmodernism uh, results in people believing that men can get pregnant uh, or that inflation is caused by greedy shopkeepers. Uh, it's a serious academic movement that has become the background mindset of the entire Western secular world. If the Western church ever falls, it will be because of postmodernism. Uh, when it comes to uh, the, uh, the task of apologetics, the postmodernist uh, will reply to any, uh, uh, any uh, proposition, any evidence that that might be true for you, but it's not true for me. It's totally relative. It uh, has to be understood in some different context. It cannot mean what you think it means. Uh, and uh, these folks will reject everything. Uh, because that's who they are. Uh, it's a, uh, most Christian young people who've grown up in the more or less Western world have been indoctrinated in the moral and factual relativism, which is postmodernism. Uh, uh, any, uh, any young people who, 
uh, uh, spend time on their computer, spend time on their phone, spend time watching TV, uh, read um, modern popular literature of any sort, who, who've been to the government schools in most of the Western world, uh, have, have learned to swim in a sea of postmodernism. At its root, postmodernism denies that any truth claims can be absolute. Uh, by its nature, the claims of Christianity are absolute. The conflict is everywhere, all the time, for anyone who's trying to teach the Christian faith. Uh, I've, I've run into headwinds teaching the absolute truth of Christianity uh, in entirely Christian environments. Uh, college students at, uh, at the Moody Bible Institute. Uh, they would like to believe that an awful lot of things are culturally relative. It depends. Uh, I've uh, run into headwinds with other faculty members. Uh, the idea that uh, truth is absolute and exists forever in the mind of God is getting to be a very unpopular minority view. <laughs> okay, so postmodernism is a huge challenge. It's a particularly a huge challenge for evidentialism. Uh, and we have to find ways around that. Uh, we do, uh, but it's uh, it definitely hard. Uh, the conflict is everywhere in practice. The postmodernist will simply reject your evidence. I don't like it, no matter what it is, since by definition, there's no such thing as truth. Uh, uh, the, uh, the absolute statement, absolute truth is impossible, has to be accepted as absolutely true. <laughs> the, the contradiction in terms is what it is, uh, but what are you going to do at the end of the day? Postmodernists uh, miss the fact that when they claim truth does not exist, they are making a truth claim. If their claim is true, then it is false. If their claim is false, then it is false. But don't tell that to a non-Christian, they'll probably just swear at you and walk away. Uh, it can get... Uh, it can get old. Okay, next time we get together, we're just over an hour now. That's a good time to stop. Next time we get together, we're going to go back to uh, John Warwick Montgomery and look more carefully uh, at uh, the, the evidence for a bunch of things, including the resurrection. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, next time should be kind of interesting. Should be, uh, should be kind of fun. Let me make this go away. And let me go this go away. I'll unmute everybody that wants to. Okay. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for being a, uh, an attentive audience. It's, uh, it's always a lot of fun. Amen. Uh, Oscar, my bro, uh, we'll, we'll see you thank next you. time. Okay. <laughs> And uh, oh boy, I'm looking at everybody. I mean, uh, thank you, Dr. John. Uh, Roger, good to see you, my friend. Hey, I like your background. What is that? That's that's neat. <laughs> All right, bye bye, everybody. We'll see you. We'll see you next Wednesday at the same time and the same place. God bless everybody. <laughs>